Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and uh, on show number 250 with me is Michael Kester. Hey, how's it going? This is a far way we have made it. Yeah, the big 250. Yeah, it's an arbitrary number, but it's a really good arbitrary number, I think. Yeah. It's also kind of a special show for us because we've been doing, I think we can handle about one David Lynch film per year. And we're officially at a point where we said, no, fuck it. We're going to do two David Lynch films. That's a good idea. We've been moving up in, in double featuredom. We're getting more double feature than we've ever... I mean, we're becoming more double feature. The other thing is we've always been concerned on our David Lynch shows that there's so much to talk about with David Lynch films that we kind of want to pack that end a little heavy right. and maybe bring a shorter film or something where, you know... We have less to say, or and that never really happens. Right. We, no, we tried that last time by doing Freaks. I don't know what we were thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like somehow we'd have less to say about Freaks. I don't know. Uh, so this year we said, no, you know what? We're just going to run a little long. It'll be fine. People like that. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I guess. that's this, fine too. This one time it'll be all right. We're going to uh, extensively cover uh, two David Lynch films. Yeah. Which films are we doing? Uh, we're going to do um, Eraserhead, which is the big David Lynch poster child film. Yeah. Film for a long time, I thought, had a picture of David Lynch on the cover. <laughs> yeah, and, sure. And uh, then we're going to do Wild at Heart, which is um, it's another film that has a crazy person on the cover of it. And we are going to spoil those movies. Uh, you can use the chapters to skip over um, something else we want to talk about and yeah. skip over what I'm talking about right now. And get right into the uh, the David Lynch films, one of which is, as you said, an early artistic crazy thing. <laughs> and the other of which probably looks weirder being on this show with Eraserhead than it would yeah. in a normal lineup of films. Yeah. But there's another thing uh, we wanted to talk about a little bit. There is another thing. And it's, uh, it's year six. We want to talk about next year in double feature. We really want to do a year six. Which is a continual struggle, as uh, as you know. Yeah. Um, we're gonna we're gonna run a Kickstarter for Year Six, which uh, we have the whole breakdown for why the Kickstarter and why now and what the hell else over at the actual Kickstarter page. Yeah. We're at a point now where it's no longer self sustainable. And... Yeah, unfortunately not. But you know, we've been soliciting a lot of these Kickstarter ideas. Yeah, And uh, you had a foray into Kickstarter yourself, and I feel really good about this. You know, I think our audience has brought us through a lot over the years. We've learned a lot of stuff together. They've gone on every stupid adventure that we've, uh, sure. we've gone. Will people come along for this? And I realize this is a big ask. Yeah. But you and I have talked about it a lot, and it's, uh, it's kind of come to a point where we didn't know if we could make it happen. And I think this is our answer. Yeah, I, no, hope, I, I hope it's our answer. Fingers crossed. Right. But as we've been soliciting, uh, you know, what kind of incentives would people like, including picking movies for year six, which yeah. everybody's going to be really excited about. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, Blade Runner is out. We're not going to do Blade Runner. <laughs> uh, I think we'll have to talk about that. If, uh, <laughs> if some, I mean, that's the thing, right? If somebody, if somebody gets the incentive and wants us to do Blade Runner. I mean, are you going to bar that from the table? Tell me here and now, would you do Blade Runner on the show? I'll do, I'll do Blade Runner. I'm just afraid that people are going to be terribly disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> so we did have people ask, well, you've somehow managed to do the show for five years without all this money, just getting by on the donations. Right. And while the donations are less now than they have been in, in a couple previous years, we're still getting them and we're really thankful for that. But we, uh, we felt the need to make a whole video kind of explaining some recent stuff that's happened mm -hmm. and uh, give people, you know, give people essentially the answer to why we need this in order to go forward with the show in the future. Yep. Also, it'll give people a chance to look at us finally instead of just hearing us. And right, that's yeah. something the Internet wanted, I guess. Apparently. So that's kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com. Easy enough URL to remember, right? Yeah, I got it. And uh, it's pressing. So we're starting it now. Uh, please go give a pledge and uh, we'll make this fucking thing happen. 
Also, a racer head is a thing that happened. A racer head? That is a perfect... Wow, you know, I could move on to uh, Wild <laughs> at a, Heart right is now. It's a thing that happened. So I want to tell you about putting a razor head <laughs> on the show first. Okay. Because this is another thing. I mean, this does kind of go along with the Kickstarter. I've been feeling really kind of inspired and invigorated about our show. So you wanted to watch a razor head to get bust you back <laughs> down two notches. Well, a razor head is very much on this show, maybe even more so than hamster style. We have started talking about white cat films. Yeah. Uh, films that pet the white cat or uh, it started films, with uh, enter the dragon you know as we've brought up all these white cat films it's been it's been this great thing we found where films are more accessible than they might lead you to believe you're a little scared you won't get it and it turns out the villain pets a white cat it's not really that hard you've seen some of it before you recognize it and you're trying to tell me that at some point a racer head stopped being scary i i assume uh that's not what i'm trying to tell you oh, okay <laughs> that's actually the point i'm coming to is a racer head is what i fear the white cat films are before i get the relief yeah because a racer head is not a white cat film no a racer head i do finish and i you know, there was a part of me that went, well, I've seen Eraserhead a few times. Maybe it is a, a white cat film. I haven't seen it in a while. Sure. And, you know, we finished watching it and um, nope, <laughs> I, I am terrified. I'm terrified because I feel like, you know, we owe something to David Lynch. What he does in cinema, I mean, the place that he has, I still, to this day, show 250, 500 plus movies later, feel like you do not see a guy like David Lynch anywhere else, yeah. you know, in movies. We try so desperately to go, well, maybe it's kind of like this, or maybe it's kind of like that. Take something unfamiliar and compare it to something familiar. Mm -hmm. And man, we never really have as much of a problem doing that as with David Lynch. Yeah, no, it's definitely true. And Eraserhead is not the, it's not the easiest one to dive into. It may be one of the hardest, man. I would definitely say it's the hardest. It's the one, I mean, so let's see. There's one other David Lynch movie that I've not seen. Prior to watching Eraserhead, I had not seen Eraserhead, and I had not seen Firewalk with me. Oh, sure. Um, well, Firewalk with me is the Twin Peaks film. Right, so which is I would why imagine... I stayed away from it. It's It's not that I'm scared of it, not that I'm not interested. It's that I haven't watched all of Twin Peaks, and so I don't want to watch a movie about it. Right. Um, although I've read that it is both a prequel and a sequel to the Twin Peaks story. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So, That's about what you'd expect, I guess. <laughs> um, Eraserhead was the one I was most afraid of for two reasons. Because of its massive cult appeal and the people mm -hmm. that I know like Eraserhead right. are way, way better at film than I am. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm just scared of it in general. And then also it's David Lynch. It's his first film. Sure. He it's this is before even the elephant man. This is before people knew who David Lynch was. Right. So this is before he had to even verify any type of artistic license. When you watch something like Lost Highway or Mulholland Drive, you go, all right, this is going to be a little confusing. It's going to be a little tricky. But this is somebody who knows his craft. Yeah. Another scary facet of Eraserhead is you're going, this is somebody's student film. Right. Maybe David Lynch doesn't have a vision yet. Right. You know, maybe he's not saying anything. Maybe he's just speaking symbolically. Maybe there's sure. no narrative. I don't know. Well, and the other thing that's scary about that is the last David Lynch film I'd seen was Inland Empire. Sure. And that is a film that has no set direction. And I don't mean mm -hmm. he didn't direct the film. I mean, he wrote it as he filmed it. Yeah. And so I know he's capable of that. And that is at. Sure. That is the film following Mulholland Drive. Yeah. So. That was pretty much the end of his full length. Right. Films. It was. I don't want to say the end of his career. He's done a lot of shorts and so forth. Uh, appeared on uh, Louie. Yeah. <laughs> as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was. I don't know how we didn't bring that up when we talked about uh, Pootie Tang. But we yeah. didn't. And now I've mentioned Pootie Tang on the Eraserhead show. <laughs> Damn it. I'm just losing double feature right now. But when I was watching Eraserhead, I Google image searched David Lynch 1977. <laughs> I wanted to see the guy who was telling Jack Nance to make that face and react that way to that right. thing. 
I wanted to see what he looked like. Have you ever Googled David Lynch in 1977? No, but I have done this with directors. I'm, yeah, I'm actually yeah. pleasantly surprised that you <laughs> said that because a lot of times I'll try and envision. This is yeah. a weird thing. I've, it I've is. never yeah. talked to you about this. I just, I just want to see what the person yeah. telling everyone what to do looked like at this time. Exactly. Because exactly. I, can see, I can see David Lynch now telling people to do stuff and he's you know in a suit with his hip haircut and right. he's kind of got this distinguished character about him sure that i can totally see that guy creating something like and drive people respect him he has a definite vision this right. is the david lynch of you know the late 90s early 2000s yeah but the early first david lynch student <laughs> david lynch wears a raincoat and a safari hat and he has <laughs> long dark hair about down to his shoulders wow um and really? yes, he looks like a detective. Um, okay. Are you sure that's David Lynch? Yes. Wow. And uh, still in, in a lot of the pictures, it's him talking to Jack Nance and giving direction. Wow. And there's still that distinguished definitive vision in the way he's looking and the sure, way he's sure. moving. He's unwavering in the fact that he's making a film that he knows about. Yeah. And that's why I think Eraserhead comes off as such a strong effort mm -hmm. because it's insane. It is a fucking crazy movie. But if there's someone in the driver's seat of insanity knowing when to turn left. Sure, it's, sure. I mean, moderating the insanity becomes part of the vision. You kind of uh, harness it, point it in different directions. Sure, and that's how you make statements with something like that. Uh, if I remember, it's it took something like five years to make this. It was a $10,000 film. Yeah, he kept losing funding. Yeah, right, right. So he made it kind of in college and... It's weird you mentioned the way he looked because a lot of people look at the cover of Eraserhead and think, oh, that's a picture of David Lynch. Right. But that's kind of the haircut that, you know, very large. I mean, people know what David Lynch looks like. Yeah. But I think as much as I'm kind of afraid of maybe this is early David Lynch or it's different, you know, I see it. And there's a very um, there's something about how surreal it is that actually is kind of calming which is a very strange thing because that's not the intention at all. But when you're looking at it analytically, trying to understand something about it, really, this is the first time I'm watching it to go, all right, I want to know what the fuck's going on here. The fact that I can identify certain types of surrealism about the movie with other David Lynch works yep. goes, okay, so this is the same pattern of thought. This is the same kind of technique. Uh, something like the sound. All right, the sound, if you've never seen a David Lynch movie, the sound in Eraserhead, it's terrifying and it's off-putting and it brings a lot of the feeling. And I guess it still does that, obviously, if you've right. seen other David Lynch movies. Sure. But I start to remember, you know, it's a droning ambience. It's a loud white noise. It adds a lot of tone and kind of texture. And we even joked about that during the straight story. Yeah. There was a, a machine of some sort and we go, oh, well, we've discovered what makes the David Lynch sound. Yeah. You know, that is a kind of soundscape that is in his films. And as much as that is always one of the weirder elements of the movies, to see it here and go, oh, good, it's here, too. <laughs> There's yeah. something strangely, um, almost ironically calming about it. But we do see the objects here as well that make the sounds. You know, these sounds aren't just uh, the hallway generates this this dark toned noise. There's a radiator. There's dogs suckling yeah you know they they aren't pleasant things but you do see objects see the record player kind of skipping over nothing mm -hmm. and you identify where the noise that has lingered on in the beginning of the scene suddenly they'll show you an object somewhere that gives you a sense of where that comes from sure it's that kind of attention to all right when you're in a room what makes up the sensory of that room if nothing's happening right how does the ambient sound how does also uh, when we talked about dubbing, we talked about the kind of reverb, the ambience on a person's voice in a yep. room and how that mm -hmm. didn't line up. And I think David Lynch will use that in his sound as well. We'll see that a little bit uh, on Wild at Heart. Yeah. But there are moments in Eraserhead that are clearly, well, maybe they're not dubbed, but they're made to sound like they're in a different room sure. than the natural sounds that are being uh, hyped into the audio makeup of the movie sure so it adds another surreal element of 
the characters aren't in the same place as all of the all of the sound that's around them. Mm -hmm. We also have the Fats Waller organ, yeah, which is uh, a, a piece of this that seems more in line with something like Freaks that we did, yeah, than a lot of the other David Lynch stuff. Um, Fats Waller was a famous uh, what jazz pianist, right? Yeah, yep, died in the forties. Uh, he has a song. I think it's um, Lenox Avenue Blues, I think is the only song that's in the movie. But it's that organ stuff, right? Sure. And it's it's when the movie, it's not quite the ominous organ right. yet, but when we start seeing the baby, we get, it almost sounds like a funhouse organ. Yeah. It has a very 1920s silent film yep. uh, kind of feel to it. So we've talked a lot about David Lynch creating a, a surreal place and a feeling, but so as kind of an exercise, I guess. Sure. How would you describe where Eraserhead takes place? You know, I think for me, I would definitely off the top of my head say it takes place in a room. Mm -hmm. I know it moves out of the room. It moves into another house. Um, we get a few shots that are supposed to be outdoors. Right. Um, Those are really interesting to me. Yeah. Let's stay on that for a second. Right. So when he's moving from maybe his house to her house for dinner, mm -hmm. I mean, where are they? You know, you think of Mulholland Drive and you sure. think there's a very distinct sure. place. Well, they're in L.A. Right. Hollywood. Lost Highway, even for being a little more ambiguous. Sure. You know where they're at. You can almost point to right. it on a map. Maybe sure. you could. Blue Velvet. Right. Same way. I mean, even Wild at Heart, they give you a city. So all of these places... You know, uh, I think of Twin Peaks especially because you've never seen Twin Peaks, but you know where it is. Yeah. It's at Twin Peaks. It's, yeah, right? right. But where is Eraserhead? Where is he when he's walking from house to house? You know, he, I don't know. I mean, it feels almost like. I'm not even sure what planet he's on. Well, you know, okay. So just to kind of match iconography, which I think is totally fair to do in a David Lynch film. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like the in-between of the houses. So I don't know how familiar you are with. The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> wow, we're getting to that a little early, huh? Do you remember the scene in Wizard of Oz when Dorothy's in the tornado? Sure. And she's looking out the window and someone's riding a fucking bike and there's a witch <laughs> and I don't know, a cow or something. Yeah. I feel like these houses are both in the tornado. Yeah, sure. And Henry's walking from one house in a tornado out to the next house, you know. Sure. Further down the whirlwind. Right. And I, I mean, I feel like these houses exist very firmly in an entirely limbo based reality. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is that, you know, that reality, I don't really know. I'm asking you because I don't really know. I mean, I guess you can't know, but I get this idea. If you were to walk outside one of those houses and just look outside, I mean, I don't really know what you see. And it's right, not exactly. often you can think that about a movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of building you know, your setting is that you could hypothetically walk into a place that exists in the reality of the movie, but that they never show you on screen sure. and have kind of an idea of what it's like. Well, and there's even those shots kind of early on where he's walking through the train yard. That's that yeah. kind of reminds me of those scenes in um, the trial, the Orson Welles yeah, trial. Sure. And uh, I mean, so there is kind of a placement to the film, but I don't think that its location is the important aspect of it i think because the thing you have to keep in mind is the only real look into the outside world that you ever get is that whatever this baby is isn't weird enough for everybody to be sobbing right um that sometimes heads fall down and kids are really excited to you know turn them into the eraser factory for a couple pence sure. that was a deleted scene in hostel too yeah yeah um and uh but the world is not firmly based in in surrealism because Henry's freaked out the whole time. Yeah, he is. Well, I also think his troubles might be separate from the, you know, the how scary the baby looks might not be as troubling to him as the fact there's just a baby. And I think that's an interesting off-putting thing to the audience. Right. Is you're horrified how everything looks. And I think Henry's horrified because, you know, a girl likes him and he has to meet her family. Right. Well, and that's the thing is I think that I think that a lot of the imagery in Eraserhead is kind of this weird look at it's a surrealistic look at it's a it's a big theme with David Lynch. It's kind of the 50s 
La La Land. It's kind of, you know, Crybaby. Remember Crybaby? Sure. You know, that aspect of like the 50s. Sure. Boys like girls and girls like boys, but everything's kind of hard about that. Right, right. And I feel like Eraserhead is kind of this film that explores that on a very surreal level where it goes, this film is about teen pregnancy, say. Sure. And instead of the realistic, wow, look how, you know, that baby's a real thing. And that's a horrible thing because that's a real person that you've created and now you have to deal with that. No, it's scary because that thing's a fucking monster. Right. I mean, the representation lives as whatever that goat llama thing with measles sure, is. Sure. And and that's so much scarier to see it through the eyes of somebody who can't get that firm of a grasp on the depth of their own reality. Well, and that's an excellent thing that making the movie so abstract does is it puts the audience in the headspace of the characters right. where you couldn't normally go. Sure. You know, you can never feel the anxiety that we're just showing you, oh, they have anxiety because they have a child now and, and they don't know, you know, unintended consequences of sure. pregnancy mm -hmm. or uh, the fears of uh, raising a kid, especially in that kind of world. You know, think about think about a concern I want you to make a film about what is it like raising a kid in today's world? Isn't that going to be scary? Sure. You build a world like this where you don't know if the sun is in the sky when you walk outside. Right. How better to express that concern to an audience who doesn't really live in your paranoid view of the world? Right. Sure. I mean, I can't, you know, this movie, so the place is kind of dark and bleak. I get the impression it's some kind of maybe a slum. Yeah. Just because there's pipes and steam everywhere. I don't know. It's something uh, like out of Brazil. Yeah. But I feel like maybe these two places, there's almost a part of me that thinks that's all there is. Mm -hmm. You know, I know because of some of the logic of the film, there has to be other things in the town, like, say, a I don't know, a racer factory or something. Right. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. But it almost seems like we're only seeing these things, not because we only have an hour and a half to tell the story, but maybe that's all that's left on planet Earth. Well, and I think that that further goes to support the whole theory of, you know, these if you look at Henry as. I mean, he's played by Jack Nance, who's an adult in the film. Mm -hmm. But try to look at him as, you know, hypothetically, not even I'm not even trying to use this analogy as a full on film study. But say he's 15, 16, right? Sure. When you were 15 or 16, how much of the world was there, really? That's very true. I mean, when you're 15 or 16 and you have a girlfriend, the world is your house her house and the the streets in between. Yeah, you're right. And the baby in the eraser factory. Sure. Obviously. Because I don't know, something traumatic happened at the eraser factory some one time yeah, in your life. Right. But I think that that's kind of, you know, aside from whether or not this is a statement on Henry being a teenager or being too young to cope with his life, I think that it's about setting up a story where you're only seeing the highlighted aspects because that is all that matters sure. to really drive home the points. And the wider you make a world, the more you have to start explaining what's happening in your story. Right, right. Something like that baby, which I keep going back to because that's kind of the centric sure. uh, weird shit that's happening. <laughs> sure. That can exist in a world where there are five characters and four of them don't think it's strange. Yeah, exactly. But if you put that in a world where there are, you know, ballpark 100 characters because there's a mailman and right. the guy that works at the post office and the bus driver and the three people on the bus that drive by. Suddenly the fact no one knows, no one can tell the baby is weird is the point of the movie. Yeah. And it it's starts... the invention of lying. Exactly. It's like, what, none of these people have ever heard of lying? How exactly. is that possible? <laughs> you know? Right, exactly. And you start having to either figure out a way to explain why the world is okay with this baby, or you bend your characters to be bad people who are hiding this freak. Sure. Well, then Eraserhead would be the kind of movie I could say to you, oh, it's a movie where there's a deformed baby, but everyone in the town doesn't realize it. Exactly. You know, that becomes the plot point of, uh, of the movie. So yeah, it does heighten those things. But I think it also, uh, to your point about they're only being your house and her house and the space in between. It kind of says these characters are young. That is all there is to them. 
you know, so far. Mm -hmm. Everything they discover is kind of a new thing, and we don't have to point at it sure. specifically like the horrors of birth. Yeah. Uh, we're invoking some of the very practical, messy, disgusting, terrifying parts of birth that you feel uh, probably the first time. You know, I'm not a father. I don't have any fucking clue. But I imagine that's the kind of anxiety you'd go through. Or right. the first time you actually see a birth uh, live or portrayed on film, the kinds of things that are going to be, like, you're not going to know those things. They're not part of your world yet. Right. And so this baby comes into their world. And again, it's trying to make uh, the audience feel like they've never seen a birth before, or never seen a mm -hmm. several hour old baby. Yeah. That's another thing I love about Eraserhead is it's reigniting that kind of capacity for surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, it can sicken me and it can terrify me over and over every time I see it. He's cutting the mini turkeys. That's a scene that always sticks out in oh, my yeah. mind, especially yeah. for how not about, you know, everything else the film is about that that scene is. Right. He, it's, it's David Lynch's awkward dinner party scene. Sure. Right? Yeah. He goes over and, you know, nice guy father making chit chat. He goes to cut the little mini turkey and it just oozes. And it's, yeah. he looks at it and he's horrified. He's horrified to be oozing turkey gore at this awkward dinner. Like right. the audience should be terrified. Well, and that's, that's kind of the thing that Eraserhead plays with and that's why Eraserhead can get away with being an hour and a half long film the surface level of what's going on is okay a new boyfriend has to go meet the family and it's awkward because he got his girlfriend pregnant yeah and so he's going he's trying to you know get in good with the family and you know he's part of it now but it's awkward because he kind of maybe fucked up and he doesn't know if they know and he doesn't want them to hate him right and such and such a thing and the father's a nice guy but he's a little weird and the mother's kind of strict and and standoffish so we've seen that before we've all watched the office <laughs> and you're sitting experiencing a very heightened version of the awkward meeting the parents for the first time mm -hmm. but in the interim you get something like a little bleeding poultry yeah and on top of that making the statement of wow this is weird but they seem to think it's okay yeah but it's still really weird and i'm uncomfortable and this is horrible do they realize that i'm freaking out right now you also start to get the image of you know menstruation and birth sure so you're you're working in a compound metaphor yeah you're making henry very uncomfortable at an already uncomfortable situation while reminding the audience that this movie is about you know youth and childbirth and i don't know little undergrown chickens sure. you know what i mean like yeah. that image serves to make what should be a three hour long film an hour and a half because instead of going here's an awkward dinner party and let's stir up some images of such right. and such you just go awkward dinner party is a perfect place to have a turkey bleed out of his vagina can check a couple things off the list at once right we make it sound like we have a pretty good handle on this, but I don't. I, no. I would not say that I understand. <laughs> let's no. let's backpedal to the part where I don't understand what's happening in the film. Yeah, a lot of people will get caught up uh, when I talk to them about Eraserhead. We get in this kind of argument about whether or not it's a dream, and that's always seemed really arbitrary to me. Yeah, you know, there's a malformed lamb baby in a fictional universe. Or the film is in hardened reality and Henry's dreaming of a malformed lamb baby because of the anxieties of fatherhood in a different universe. Right. You know, I don't see any difference between those yeah. things. I mean, as long as a film doesn't end with and then they woke up. Yeah, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Whether or not the film is a dream is arbitrary because you are given the precepts of the universe that the film is in. And whether I mean, you have to think about it like. What if Star Wars was all a dream that George Lucas was dreaming? Exactly. Exactly right? my point. <laughs> yeah. It is a dream. It's David Lynch's five-year-long dream that he yeah, you know, exactly. busted his ass to commit to film. Unless Star Wars ends with, and Luke woke up and, right. had, and was in his sister's and bed. And rolled over and Leia was there, right? <laughs> yeah. That, that's the only way that it matters that Star Wars is that's a dream. That's actually how my dreams end, yeah. I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But there are dreams within the film itself that I think are kind sure. of important. Or I would suspect there's dreams. A dream dreams. within a dream within a Taco Bell within a mall <laughs> inside your mind. Henry uh, starts sleeping and then he's thinking of the dancing girl. Right. You know, B 
being surrounded by worms before squishing them with their sperm worms. The worms have to be representations of sperm or fertility or, or what have or you. Or aborted babies. I mean, well, here's what I do with a racer head. Anytime I don't understand imagery, I go, oh, yeah, like fertility or something. Right. That's just that's how you solve a racer head. Sure. You just go, yeah. I it probably means fertility. David Lynch deals a lot with two things, and it's youth and death. And you can pretty much zero out anything confusing by trying to categorize it in at least one of those two categories. Well, I think sexuality is another big thing, but you could very yeah, but much I think, lump that into youth. Yeah, I think in David Lynch's eyes, the youth sexuality tends to get lumped together. Because if you look at the characters who tend to be sexually driven or victims of sexuality, and we'll move into that a lot more in the next film, mm -hmm. it's always kind of with baggage. Yeah. And that is definitely something that I would attribute more to youth than just general sexuality. Well, look how often we see younger boys seduced by older women. Right. Or taboo love or, you know, in Eraserhead, uh, her mom kind of coming on to him. Right. Which would not be the last time in today's discussion that'll come <laughs> up. You know, that is a, kind of a reoccurring motif with David Lynch. And I think that does tie into... You're young and you don't know about the world and you don't know about sex yet mm -hmm. and kind of living in an era of that. So I mentioned the fertility thing because there's one thing that I can't just uh, brush aside as fertility. And that's when his head comes off and is stolen by a child and made into pencil erasers. Yeah. So I have a few theories about what this means, but I definitely think that one of the I want to say strong. I want to say strong and intelligent, but I'm going to call it a dick move. <laughs> sure. I think um, one of the biggest dick moves David Lynch has made about this film is taking the least accessible part of it and calling the movie that. Yeah, I know. I know. Because suddenly you think you've got a grasp on the film uh -huh. and you're like, okay, yeah, I got it. Okay, yeah, I see what's going on here. Wait, what? And it's called a razor head, so that's clearly the most important thing that's happening. Yes. I I literally <laughs> wrote that down. It says, with this being the film's title, uh, the sequence carries importance, and so it's that's why I even bring it up. Yeah. There might be smaller things in the movie I don't totally get. Why is there a plant next to his bed? You know, whatever. Sure. And I just... I can brush it aside. I can go, well, and then I, I don't really understand that one, but it's fine. Let's talk about the bulk of what the film is getting at. Let's make sure right. I get the film. But yeah, you're right. Then he fucking calls it a racer head. And I go, uh, this scene's really important. It's not okay that right. I have no clue what's going on. So to talk about a racer head as a thing, right? So mm -hmm. not a racer head, the movie, but a racer head, the term. People always, what's that colloquialism? That's why pencils have erasers. Is that what they say? I've never heard that, but all right. I could probably tell you what that's getting at. People, so it's like, oh, you know, I made a mistake. That's why pencils have yeah, erasers. Sure. Well, fuck that. Most people use pens, but whatever. We'll go with the colloquialism. Calling you so far. You know, Henry's head mm -hmm. still can correct mistakes. Yeah, it, sure. Or at least at the very core of his being, he, his mind, his brain is able to correct Right. For whatever mistakes or blemishes are being made. And that, I think, is, I think the overarching point there, or at least how it comes off to me, is that the reason Henry doesn't give up on the baby, the reason Henry doesn't, you know, hate his girlfriend, the reason Henry lives in this shitty home, the reason all of this is because in his mind, he can fix it. Sure. And he is set on creating. You know, again, I'm going to go back to the perfect 50s lifestyle because that's just the invocation that I see in this film and in general, David Lynch. Sure. He thinks he can be a happy teenager. He thinks that that is something he can reconcile. Yeah. And so maybe his head coming off and being replaced by this baby. And then you kind of see the inner workings of it where why is he sticking around? Why is he putting up with this? Why is he still trying to go to sleep in the same room as this freak? It's because he thinks he can make it okay. And that's why he tries to help the baby. That's why he, you know, checks its temperature. And eventually the unwinding arc is that he can't. Yeah. And that's the general downfall is his lack of knowing when to bail, which his girlfriend does. Sure. Sure. Results in his demise. So he doesn't know when you, to quit. That you say that's when to bail. There's a baby sitting there and she takes <laughs> off. You're like, well, that was the correct move. You'd make a great father. <laughs> well, I mean, there's just, you know what I mean? There are points, there are points in a, in a terrifying story where you fucking 
you know, you set your sights on the tree line and you run and you don't ever look back. Interesting. Do not stop running. Do not look back. Yeah, right. Your friends are all going to die. Leslie's going to kill everyone. But if you want to survive, you set your sights for the tree line and you don't stop running. I like that approach to the scene a lot. Uh, I think it makes more sense than anything I've ever talked to anybody about. I watch this scene and I, I mine it for clues. I think that's mm-hmm. the best thing to do when you can, you know, we're kind of lucky with Eraserhead. I can point at a five minute section of the film and go that, isolate that chunk. Yeah. That's the one I sure. don't get. And you can watch it again and again and you can go, you know, write down every single fucking thing that happens. Write down, uh, you know, what story is being conveyed with this. What I think just getting a list of the things that happen or what the characters are paying attention to can kind of say, well, where is the scene pointing me? Right. And a big deal is made about the, you know, the head's brought in, it's made into erasers, and then all the characters sit there in anticipation of the approval of, is it yeah. good enough? Is it an eraser, an effective eraser? And the dream sequence, whether it's a dream or not or whatever ends in it's okay and that completely aligns with what you're talking about Mm -hmm. that kind of moment of you know is my head going to be able to take care of this and that reaffirmation that yeah actually you can still handle this and we see the eraser dust in that particular scene and we see it again after you know killing the baby and i think it makes perfect sense with what you're saying he gets up feeling motivated, going, there's still something I can do about this. My dream right. has told me I have the capacity for this. Mm-hmm. And he gets up and he erases the baby. And you right. see the dust. I mean, I think that's symbolically at least one thing we could be talking about. Yeah. The nature of symbolic storytelling is it's open to interpretation. Sure. And it could mean a lot of things. I'm kind of curious what it means for David Lynch. You can take any right. meaning you want out of it. But uh, the intention is one of the most curious things to me. Absolutely. Same. Another weird part of that scene, though, is when his head comes off, the baby's head is in his. Right. (laughs) So, I mean, I don't know. It it gets so complicated. I think maybe it's another kind of fear of fatherhood. That your baby will replace your head. Well, maybe. You know what I mean? Well, that that your head. No, yeah. It's that mortality you talked about. That you're going to die off. That your kid might grow up to become like you. That he might run through the streets stealing heads. I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. again, open to interpretation. You never know with kids these days. I think it helps to watch David Lynch movies thinking about the theme and the plot as similar or the same. Yeah. You know, they do so much to drive to the same ends. Yeah. We're talking about pregnancy. We're talking about unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. Uh, Both of these characters seem kind of inexperienced. You know, Mary has found uh, found out about being pregnant, maybe, and that's why she stopped coming around. Yeah. Those are kind of the plot points. But then when we look at a lot of these questions we have, I think it might be helpful to try and link those things up sure. through different themes, right. different motifs, different kind of, of symbolism. Mm-hmm. So moving into Wild at Heart, that's something that I don't think is nearly as true. I don't think the movie, that's that was my interest in pairing this with Wild at Heart is this is a movie driven by narrative rather than being driven by symbolism. And that's a, that's a lot different than the average David Lynch affair, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah. I would definitely say so. I mean, I guess there's, what, Elephant Man and Dune. Those were... Oh, my God. I forgot about Dune. Well, that's kind of the period, though. We had Eraserhead and then Elephant Man and Dune and then um, Blue, Velvet. Blue Velvet. And then came Wild at Heart. Right. So and then uh, then um, then all the Twin Peaks stuff and Lost right. Highway and the Straight Story. And, That's the one. Hold on, I can almost do the whole thing. Uh, Mulholland Drive, right? And Inland Empire. Inland Empire. There we go. And Rabbits is in there <laughs> somewhere. Rabbits. Right. I would throw into all the shorts though. I don't have the shorts memorized in the same way. I'm pretty confident that that is actually the the exact order. Wild at Heart is a book adaptation, so it's. I think it would be unfair right after talking about Eraserhead to go, well, that's when David Lynch was making all these straightforward stories. Right. But uh, Elephant Man and Dune were certainly a little bit more linear, a little bit more narrative. Mm -hmm. And Wild at Heart being based off a book, I think, aside from when we talked about the straight story, this might actually be the most straightforward narrative. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, it is. It's so it's, contrast that a little bit for me because we just got off of Eraserhead and we're right. thinking about symbolism and so forth. You'd still say there's a good amount of symbolism in this movie, right? I think that the symbolism in Wild at Heart falls more under iconography and um, sure. and it's extroverted symbolism, which is something that one, David Lynch almost never does. And two, we almost never see on double feature. What do you mean by extroverted symbolism? Well, specifically take something like the uh, snakeskin jacket. Okay. Yeah. Um, where, <laughs> sure, I guess you really couldn't get a better example than that. Right. Where uh, he literally says, this is a snakeskin jacket and it's a symbol of my freedom and individuality. Right. Um, no less than twice. Has to make sure right. we know. It's this interesting technique in storytelling because especially in the this is what the the this is 1990 yeah so this is right at the the height of you know films kind of crossing over into the more subtle stuff this is this is what a couple years before silence of the lambs gets the oscar um where these characters have to play subtly and stories are told in in this I mean, we never get too far from it. Citizen Kane has always been out. <laughs> sure. And and people will always tout subtlety as the strength of a wonderful film, right? I might argue that Citizen Kane is not a subtle film, but I, I think I would have uh I would need a four hour episode of double feature to uh <laughs> to do that. Citizen Kane, one of the films you can request using the sure. double feature Kickstarter. <laughs> Kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com. This is great. Wild at heart, it isn't subtle. And that is possibly what is strongest about it you get david lynch's crazy vision where characters paint their face with lipstick yeah where willem dafoe is in it <laughs> just <laughs> right. different stuff that makes things weird willem dafoe's teeth right and instead of having them play these nuanced subtle characters that we're so used to and almost egregiously graded on maybe that's me personally but I'm getting so tired of subtle characters. <laughs> I mean, I've never been a huge fan of subtle characters. I'm not going to be the one that comes on double feature and goes, why can't Ryan Gosling kick more ass in drive? I wish he would say more <laughs> sure. um, because it works <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah. But I mean, I will always, if you tell me two movies are coming out, right, Eric? And one of them is about Joaquin Phoenix and he has a subtle accent and a scar and the other one is Rose McGowan has a rocket launcher for a leg. <laughs> right. I'm going to go see, see you, one of those at midnight. I see what you did there. I believe you're stealing <laughs> someone else's premise and adding your own unique spin on it. <laughs> That'd be great if there was just a series of Rose McGowan exploitation films where we just replace different limbs for different <laughs> weapons and pretend this is a unique idea. Where did that series right. go? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, I think you're thinking... Trick or treat. Maybe not even uh, as broadly as all films of the 90s versus films of the 80s, but especially look at that kind of neo-noir genre that David right. Lynch plays in. Sure. I mean, full of subtlety. Noir, yeah. so full of subtlety, it, it pains the genre, mm -hmm. you know, and then you get things like Seven that are particularly notable in, you know, being popular for betraying some of that subtlety for... sure. People think back to Seven, which is a movie that has a lot of subtlety, but they think back to it for its kills and its, you know, gross, the seven deadly sins, right? It's always in a horror thriller genre. Exactly. And to me, it should be in a nuanced drama genre. Sure. And they kind of do the same thing for Silence of the Lambs. You know, yeah. there are the big moments that people will quote from are the over-the-top moments. And, Ted Levine. And it's Ted Levine the, uh, in Silence of the Lambs. Not the subtle moments that it, you know, perhaps uh, gained critical notoriety for. Or a title from. <laughs> or a title from. So Wild at Heart is in that genre that's filled with neo-noir subtlety and larger-than-life moments, and we just chuck huge characters, yeah. gigantic characters into this movie. One of the things that I love about Wild at Heart, and no, it's not that it's a man and a woman uh, on a crime spree <laughs> yeah, in a say, convertible on the highway. You love that it's a road movie with Nicolas Cage. Don't you fucking lie to me. <laughs> I know exactly what you love about Wild at Heart. It's that the film kind of unwinds in this perfectly logical way, which, yes, it's still a David Lynch film. But you have these characters who are almost aimless. They have general motivation to 
move. That's kind of where they are. Sure. And you're sitting there going, what is the end game? How does this finish? You know, for me, you know, it's the Thelma and Louise kind of. I mean, I'm not going to spoil the end of it, (laughs) but eventually films run out of stuff to do and there's only one thing left to do, right? That's kind of where I imagine Wild at Heart has to end. Right. There's there's something that has to give for these characters. And instead of something having to give, Willem Dafoe comes in as this fucking he seems like an angel, turns into a total fucking monkey wrench. Yeah. And instead of these characters free life blossoming into the ultimate freedom, uh, some guy comes in and goes, I don't know, I'm gonna use you guys. Yeah. Thanks for right. being aimless. Sure. About halfway through the movie, too. Yeah. When we've established some kind of course. I mean, talk about a wrench in the works. That's that's absolutely where, you know, he winds up. He's literally coming in halfway through the adventure and fucking everything up. But that's where I see a lot of David Lynch in the movie is in that setup. Sure. In boy meets girl, you know, romance, 50s. Just keep throwing out 50s. Right? Yep. But okay, so think about those ideas in Eraserhead. Think about mm-hmm. um, Blue Velvet was kind Blue of that Velvet. boy meets girl Dennis sure. Hopper happens, you know. Right. Yeah. Wild well, it's at in heart Mulholland. is boy meets girl. Willem Dafoe happens. Mulholland Drive is the same way. Lost Highway is such a good example of runaway road adventure. David Lynch happens. That's what happens yeah. in Lost Highway. Yeah. <laughs> David Lynch gets a hold of boy meets girl. I feel like there are two sides to this that are constantly the fact that they pull at each other is what makes the movie so interesting. Yeah. Because on one side you have novelization boy meets girl story, things David Lynch, you know, that appeal to David Lynch, but are not uh, so much his works. And then on the other side, you have the type of David Lynch surrealism and things that you don't see in this movie, but that trickle in even because he can't help himself. Right. You know, the the question of how do we score the movie? Right. So there's got to be Elvis stuff because Elvis stuff is romancing and Southern. Sure. But then there's also speed metal. (laughs) <laughs> you know, because yeah. David Lynch can't fucking help himself. Yeah. And it's I love it. I that's the best fucking part is watching those two things play against each other, almost like they're in conflict. Mm-hmm. And the accidental harmony that's created there is the magic of Wild at Heart. Right. It's, uh, you know, it's in that first fucking scene on the staircase. They go to fight and you're feeling like, well, this is this is kind of not David Lynch. This is kind of something different. And then that metal kicks in, and it's just, wow, that right. kind of doesn't belong here. What a strange part of, right. you know, it's a prevalent part of the movie's texture. Sure. Well, and in retrospect, it just kind of feels like that's Nicolas Cage. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you have to keep in mind, this is 1990. This is, Nicolas Cage had been nominated for an Academy Award just a few years before this. This is way before Season of the Witch and The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Sure, and sure. Bad Lieutenant. Port of Call, New Orleans, and Bangkok Dangerous, and wow. Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance. And- Everything you need to know about Double Feature is that I just gave the complete David Lynch filmography off the top of my head, and you told me everything that Nicolas Cage has done between 2005 and 2007. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, you're right. This is the soundtrack that is in his head. This is in Nicolas Cage's head. Right. I almost do feel like when I start watching the movie, that the soundtrack isn't really happening. It's just in the character's head. And then when they go dancing, mm-hmm. you know, it's as if David Lynch knew people were thinking that because he puts the fucking hair metal uh, band on stage yeah. to go, no, they're real. They're so real. They're literally here at the dance playing the song. Right. He goes, let's go dancing. And there's that great transition from her feet on the bed to the, uh, you know, to them being at the concert. Yeah. And it's as if that scene is just there to confirm that it's real. And then we go back to making the metal band play Elvis. I mean, it's so perfect. Mm -hmm. We show you the band. We go, the metal is real. They dance to metal like it's a southern hoedown. And then they throw him the mic and start playing Elvis. The hair metal band starts playing Elvis with those same you know, samples out of the ambience, out of the, in the wrong reverb uh-huh. of the girl just screaming over and over, the crowd effect of girl screams. Yeah. You want to talk about what movie is a dream? Yeah. I think Wild at Heart is all in Nicolas Cage's head. Yeah. That alternation between metal and Elvis just keeps going through the movie. Yeah. We weren't satisfied just doing that for the beginning, but that is yeah. part of the style. 
the um the other parts of the style are similar things that we've seen before they're the blue velvet type moments of violent sexuality mm -hmm. and i think man do we get a gamut in wild at heart it's everything from being cornered in the bathroom to just flat out rape yeah so i mean we have stuff that's on that blue velvet line of voyeurism this is kind of not okay and then her mom's coming on to him, but not really. Yeah. I mean, she's cornering him in a bathroom, which is sort of an uncomfortable place. Certainly invokes private moments, at mm -hmm. least. You know, there's a separation between men and women. And breaking all of those lines, not really doing anything sexual to him. Right. But also the altercation on the staircase invokes that. And then by the time you get to rape, I mean, what could be the you know that is the pinnacle of violent sexuality sure that's the idea that we're all talking about without talking about when we invoke those stranger david lynch watching from the closet voyeuristic this isn't supposed to happen kind of ideas right you've mentioned the 50s part being a lot of the style i mean where do you see the 50s in wild at heart well elvis doesn't hurt um, sure i think you know the 50s in wild at heart is uh it's mostly in Lula's backstory. Yeah. I see I a lot see, of it in Lula. I see the uh the kind of broken home aspect and and the the trophy mom that doesn't want to give her daughter away to that punk kid. Yeah. And and the the need to rebel against what is the accepted norm of adulthood. Sure. Um the convertible is right. is a perennial sign of freedom in the 50s i mean it's a sign of freedom pretty much throughout all time but if you really think about the 50s and that guy you shouldn't be hanging out with yep. he's got a drop top yeah also i think the treatment of prison really that's an interesting one. is a little bit more uh in tune with you know the the, the mid 1900s kind of chain gang do your time right get in do there sit time. in the cell for five years get out get out yeah come back to the woman who's waiting for you exactly yeah, i could see that that if if you think about prison and its treatment in especially the 80s but also more recently in in the 2ks you get this idea that prison is end game that if you get arrested it's just as bad as dying yeah you're done and i i i will definitely attribute a lot of that to video game entering this the you know social norm because in a lot of games especially games that want a t rating as opposed to an m rating <laughs> your character right. gets arrested and that's game over i mean you can attribute that to a lot of factors i think about the death penalty a little bit in that yeah as you know the rest of the world and maybe parts of the u.s kind of grow away from use of the death penalty you go to prison you go for life right you know it's kind of the same you don't get the same movie where it's like you can do your time or you can live in prison because at least you didn't get the death penalty right but i mean i guess there's a lot of factors that go into that but i agree there has been a change sure and so this this film puts a character in prison twice I mean, yeah. that is unheard yeah, right. of <laughs> right. in modern cinema, unless the film is some sort of, you know, this time he's going to do it right and he's a punk and whatever. Well, yeah, they don't even make a big deal out of it. Yeah, Similar to Eraserhead, this isn't the movie where Nicolas Cage goes to jail twice. Exactly. And it, it totally should be because that's a thing that doesn't normally happen. But that's that's not what this is about. This is this is a film about the longevity of the human spirit. And the hooks of a human desire once they're planted firmly in an ideal. Sure. And prison only serves as kind of this way to show that more time has passed, but without having to explain what happened to the characters. Yeah. It's a way to show that these characters' story arced over 20 years. Sure. But you don't have to watch the characters change for 20 years because that's not going to happen with these characters right they're they're set in who they're going to be and how things are going to be and it doesn't matter how many times they go to jail yeah because they're eventually going to get out and be the way they want to be not even prison could separate them exactly you know, i think about that too i think about uh using it as a mechanic to see his kid mm -hmm. uh at the end of the movie sure when I think about the 50s style, I think about the David Lynch type of woman, like we once described in a very different way, the Russ Meyer type of woman. Sure. 
David Lynch, I think, uh, might even accidentally. Well, yeah, Laura Dern. Well, Laura Dern's mom too. Yeah, the actress as well as the character. I think her name is Diane. Uh, Diane Ladd, maybe. Yeah, that's her mom. Yeah. Uh, but does you know look just like her daughter? Both of them feed into that. I think it's a '50s Hollywood blonde kind sure. of David yeah. Lynch girl. It's the uh, it's the girl next door version of the blonde bombshell of the '40s. Right. Yeah, because I don't think it's the same as the blonde bombshell. Right. I don't think it's uh, you know, when you say '50s, you want to just say pinup right, right after that. Sure. And I think it's a little bit different than that. Yeah. And now you know David Lynch obviously also has the Isabella. Uh, Rossellini type character. Right. Well, and she's more of the femme fatale type that sure. she's she's the ne'er do well woman who comes in and isn't the type of woman you mingle or mix with. Yeah. So there's that, and I think that's separate. But when you look at uh Laura Dern's character, mm-hmm. Lula, or you look at uh Lula's mom, you know, you're thinking about that kind of polka dots dress or right. the the blonde hair is a big part of it. They even kind of have a conversation about the blonde hair in the movie. Yeah. You know, they're calling attention to a lot of that aesthetic. They're talking about uh, the red lipstick is another one. You mentioned it. Sure. I mean, we subvert the idea of 50s, you know, beautiful girl in red lipstick. Lou's mom covers her whole fucking face in it. Right. It's all over her hands. You know, we're trying to look at the look at that icon of the 50s and do something a little surreal with it. Mm hmm. Another part of the style of this movie that I think is really strange is the momentary flashbacks. Uh, all throughout the movie, you have, whether we're invoking a single image or actually brief scenes that kind of explain what was happening. Right. You know, you'll get the two characters together talking about something that happens, and immediately it'll just start showing the event that mm-hmm. happens. I can't think of another movie that does this, especially as casually as it does. It's so easy for Wild at Heart to just drop out of what it's doing and just show you, well, she's describing the scene where she was raped, so we're going to show it. Or not even describing it. She's just thinking about it. Right. Maybe even lying about it, and we'll start to just get backstory of characters. How comfortable the movie is doing that, or how casually it'll show something like the fire image. Sure. I mean, we see that fire image, what? Two dozen times right. through, the, through sure. the movie. Between cigarettes and everything else. Well, I'm even thinking about just the actual the, um, cut to flames. Yeah, right, right. right. And that's going to play a lot into one of the big symbolic pieces of the movie, one of the big themes. But then we'll also get the uh, almost irreverent story of Dell that'll happen. Yeah. Crispin Glover's character yeah. as a flashback that no one requested. Yep. Almost Family Guy style, Michael. Uh-huh. It's yeah. almost just... Oh, and remember that one time there was this guy named Dell, and it just shows... This is kind of the opposite of the technique of Eraserhead, where I think Dell is invoked to show you that while it seems like these characters are weird and they might not fit into polite society, they're aware of what weird really is. Sure, sure. It's, <laughs> it's, kind, of, it's kind of to put things in perspective, and until Dell... We're kind of thinking maybe Sailor is the weirdest guy in this universe. Yeah. And maybe he's pulling Lula down this rabbit hole of he's a crazy guy. Sure. Until masturbating Santa Claus. Yeah. At which case we go, oh, Sailor's not so bad because he's not masturbating Santa Claus. Well, and it's also one of those hints to a question I always have when I'm watching this, which is um, what portion of the movie is funny and how? How is it supposed to be funny? Right. How is it intended? How, what's unintentional? You know, there's, um, there's that scene where they're listening to the radio and she can't stand anything that's on the radio. Right. It's part of David Lynch's uh, kind of feeling about how everything in modern society is fucked up and these characters have to try and run away from it. Right. Everybody's shooting each other and we're polluting the air and everything's going to hell. But she says, she storms out of the car and says to him, I need music. They turn on the metal, and he backflips out of the car and starts doing his weird high kick dance. Yeah, I just are we laughing with this or at this? Uh, you know, I, is Nicolas Cage's high kick dance supposed to be funny? Because that's going to answer some important questions about Wild at Heart for me. It's a hard call because Nicolas Cage is notorious for overdoing it. Sure, 
Um, but that's got to be part of why David Lynch puts it. I was in the just going to say David Lynch is notorious for not letting people overdo it, sure, or asking people to overdo it. Right. I mean, think about David Lynch's relationship with Dennis Hopper. Sure. Well, and Laura Dern is. I mean, how perfect. Laura Dern is one of the most overdo it actresses <laughs> in Hollywood. I mean, if you take a situation where Laura Dern is sad or crying or scared. You have to turn the compressor up so high on your sound system so that her screaming doesn't blow up your speakers. Right. I always go back to that first scene where she, I believe, says, Sailor, he's got a knife. But it yeah. comes off as one of the sounds that they eventually later used in Jurassic Park. Um, <laughs> right. And right. Nicolas Cage doing the kick dance is just an example of these big characters. They're... They're not ashamed of who they are and where they are and why but they you th are. But you think that the people making the movie, David Lynch specifically, but everybody involved, you think this is intentional, something they're very well aware of? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think it, I think that to laugh at it is totally fine. That's uh, I think it's funny. That's appropriate, you would say? Yes. I guess, you know, Bobby blows his head clean fucking off his body, and then in the next minute, a dog runs away with a bank teller's hand. Yeah. So... <laughs> I mean, I guess you're right. I do want to talk about that moment on the radio and that theme of uh, everything going to hell, because I think that's obviously where the fire attachment is. Right. It's also in the burning the house down and all that. But uh, I know that when we talked about Blue Velvet, we talked about how David Lynch will often start movies with an idea of yeah. an image. Sure. Or Lost Highway, I guess, was the same way. Yeah. And um, while this is somebody else's story, I think he came at this with an idea of, you know, I want to talk about romance in hell. Sure. I want to talk about these two runaway characters that, you know, he's spoken to in other movies and just say, what are they running away from? Well, they're running away from fucking everything. Right. Because it's, it's an impossible relationship they're trying to have in the times we exactly. live in. Exactly. Which I think is kind of a cynical approach and clearly not something you or I believe. Mm -hmm. But when you see this fire brought up every couple seconds, just like we talked about what the candlelight meant in Blue Velvet, mm -hmm. I think that fire is representative of how awful the rest of society is. Yeah. You know, you see that used in conjunction all the times with painful past memories, uh, upbringing. You know, things other characters in the movie are doing to get the best of our main characters. Mm -hmm. Ways they're being screwed over by Bobby. You know, people who are out to get them. Right. And we'll see that all the time. And that's spun in with the more overt imagery of The Wizard of Oz. Sure. That very kind of direct, you know, we're invoking the witch. Yeah. We're showing the shoes. Mm -hmm. The clicking of the red heels or red heels through, used throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. Or the yellow brick road. I mean, we have a yellow brick road road movie. Yeah. That's what we're facing here. And then the climax of the movie becomes seeing the good witch at the end. Sure. What was directly talked about becomes even more overt. We're literally going to put a floating witch in a bubble, yeah. Uh, which reminds me a lot of we didn't even really talk about, but the dancing cheek girl, yeah, uh, with the heaven imagery mm -hmm. in Eraserhead, very very similar, yeah, type of character being this woman who's going to be the sort of salvation, or in this movie, who is the woman who just slaps some sense into Nicolas Cage, right? Also another very over the top, screams out Lula. Sorry for calling you guys fags. Sorry for calling you guys homosexuals. Takes off. Yeah. yeah, well, that's the, that's the worst part. Calls them a bunch of fags and then goes, I'm sorry for addressing you as homosexuals. Yeah. Does a Vader scream, runs off. And then we get Love Me Tender at the end of the film, which they kind of talk about throughout the film as this thing. Sure. And you know that something has been done right, where I've seen Wild at Heart maybe four times. Mm -hmm. And every time when... Sailors start singing Love Me Tender, I get goosebumps. And that's how you sure. know that <laughs> sure. a film has built its ideal to the point where you feel it as much as the characters. Well, it's not the surprise either. Because right. Because he invokes it earlier. And it's one of those things where, I mean, classic hamster style. Yeah. And so they don't rely on the surprise. They rely on everything else to give you goosebumps. Exactly. It's part of that 50s Elvis nostalgia thing, too, to run away from The Wizard of Oz 
to get that idea in your head and then run away from the gang and the turning my back on everything Mm -hmm. and run back to singing Elvis, thinking of these characters living in that place of Elvis and not in modern society where a gang can surround you and kick your ass. Right. I wanted to ask you one other thing, and that was about David Lynch's ending to this movie. So I guess I haven't read the book, Mm -hmm. but as I understand it, the end of the book is uh, that the characters split up. Okay. And so it's this more downer of an ending. David Lynch finds himself in a strange, almost a catch-22 with the ending of this movie, where the original has a downer, but he feels like he gets these characters, Mm -hmm. and it would be more true to his film, despite what the original story says. Sure. Sure to keep these characters together in the end, to say that these characters will make it through anything. Mm -hmm. And I've read him say that over and over, that he thinks that's more true to the story, which always Mm -hmm. seems funny to me because he didn't write the story, another guy did. Sure. And how could you be more true to the original story by directly betraying what the original story does? Uh, Which is funny in its own, but not, not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this dilemma he's in, where in order to make what he believes is a more authentic movie, he has to take the downer ending and turn it to be the more commercial ending. Right. He essentially feels like what the characters deserve is the same type of ending that studios cop out and give people all the time to go, well, the book had a downer ending, and downer endings don't make any money. Sure. So let's make it so the characters are happy in the end. But that's the ending that speaks to him. I mean, what do you do when you're left in that position as... You're David Lynch. You're already taking a lot of risks by making a kind of a different movie than people expect of you. What is the... Well, I the... think uh, trick one is write your own film. Mm-hmm. That would be the first thing I would do. But Try and detach it. From... Yeah. I mean, if you're... You got to look at this from two different angles. You got to look at it from your artistic... You know, you're making this film. You're not making the book. The book has been made. Yeah. You're making the film and they're putting how many millions of dollars into you making. They're not paying you to make the book. Yeah, right. The book has been made. That guy's been paid. He's been paid again because they're making the film. They're now paying you to make that book. Sure. A movie. Right. If the writer is on set, he's producing, he's, you know, supervising the screenplay, all these other things. If he's uh, if this is something more akin to adaptation then maybe you kind of have to bend to his will. But if you're making the film and you're an auteur like David Lynch is, I think it's your responsibility to your fans and to general Hollywood to make your film. Even if your film looks like it has a cop-out Hollywood ending. You know, a cop-out Hollywood ending is only has only been made a cop-out because people will sell out to do it. Sure. This is actually a triumph in that he's doing the opposite of selling out. Right. I I think that source material is just source material. Mm -hmm. I think that you can follow a biography to the T until the last fucking page when you decide that he becomes a ninja. Yeah, sure. You're making a film. You're not writing the book. You're to repaint the Mona Lisa without adding your own twist is just ripping off the Mona Lisa. Yeah, right. They have the Mona Lisa for that. Yeah, you could read the book for that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, that is. Despite how it looks, the more authentic thing is to do what you feel is right for the characters in the movie you're creating. Right. And if that makes you look like you're doing a a typical Hollywood, let's write a happier ending, then so be it. This has been a, God, this has been a, this feels like how long a show about two movies should be, which is, strikes terror into my heart. Yeah. But I was glad we got to say basically everything Mm -hmm. we wanted to about Eraserhead and Wild at Heart. What a gigantic Kickstarter launch episode. I'm I'm very happy about this. Yeah, it went really well. Um, The only website that you need this week is kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com. Like I said, feeling really good. Want to do a year six. Uh, Let's make it happen. Yeah. What are are we going to do next week? We're going to do some... I want to say 80s bands of teenagers kicking way more ass than they need to. We're doing The Warriors, which is technically from 79, but everybody will watch it and agree it's from the 80s. Sure. And Red Dawn, which is firmly planted in the 80s heyday. So watch more fucking film. Bye.